from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, which is the reading and literacy arm of the library. And we promote books, reading, literacy, and libraries around the country uh, through affiliated state centers and also uh, here at the Library of Congress through a close association with the National Book Festival, uh, the Young Readers Center, and Books and Beyond, this noontime series which features authors of books that have a special interest in, or special, in which the Library of Congress has a special interest. And often it's through the use of our collections. Uh, often it's through different projects that have been developed. Sometimes it's to show off new Library of Congress publications, which of course have an awful lot to do with the library and our collections. Uh, these talks are all um, filmed for our webcasts. And the procedure today will be for us to uh, hear a presentation from uh, John Muller, who is a friend of the libraries and a friend of uh, the Library of Congress's collections, as you will see. This is his second book. And he also is going to be talking a little bit about an author's perspective for a very special reason, and that is this is also a National History Day program that's co-sponsored by the Center for the Book and the educational outreach part of the Library of Congress, the group that really plugs the use of primary documentation and primary resources. And we have combined an effort here uh, to honor uh, 11 uh, who, high school ju uh, juniors who are joining us with their teachers uh, as part of a National History Day experience at the library. This morning, many of them were able to hear uh, Michelle Kroll from our manuscript division uh, talk to J Doris Kearns Goodwin. Uh, we also heard from the uh, historians of the House and the Senate, and they've had a very hurried tour of the Jefferson Building on the way to being here to enjoy uh, listening to John Muller himself, a historian, journalist, librarian, someone very interested in source materials. But what I love about John's work is that he's also a great fan of the District of Columbia and its history, and has now taken a look at uh, the Washington, D.C. careers of different uh, famous people, his first book being about Frederick Douglass in Washington, and his second book, which we will learn about today, uh, Mark Twain. Uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, we hope to have uh, a brief time for uh, questions and answers. And uh, because we're, set, we're filming this for the website, please turn off all things electronic. And if we get into a discussion, your participation in the discussion uh, is an indication of your willingness to be part of our website in case that part is, goes up on uh, the web. Uh, the other thing to say about John, I think, is his multi-faceted interest, really, in D.C. things. And I'm just going to read a little bit about his background. Uh, he is an associate librarian now in the Washingtonian Divis Washingtoniana Division of the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library. But he's a D.C.-based journalist, historian, playwright, and policy analyst. Uh, Frederick Douglass in Washington, D.C., the Lion of Anacostia, won a public vote to be selected as D.C. Public Library's one book in the D.C. Reading Promotion Project, which is really quite a compliment, and it's something that is very much along the lines of a Center for the Book uh, kind of promotion. Um, his writing and reporting have appeared in Washington History, The Washington Post, The Georgetowner, and other publications, and it's a very great pleasure for me to, to present John Muller to talk about Mark Twain in Washington, D.C. John? All right, thank you, everyone. You got a really big crowd. Um, I will try to keep this to uh, 
have enough time for question and answer, but I can't guarantee that that will happen because um, last time I ran a little long. Okay, uh, so yeah, so Dr. Cole gave a very kind introduction. Um, uh, the Library of Congress has been very important in the research for the Frederick Douglass book and Mark Twain book, uh, the Manuscripts Division, uh, current uh, newspapers, uh, current, per current periodicals uh, division. Um, and I, so I really couldn't have done this without uh, the help of the li Library of Congress, also the virtual uh, chat. I use that frequently. So with, that, with no further ado, I guess I'll just get into the book. Uh, so some preparatory uh, remarks on Mark Twain. He was born in November 1835. Uh, he was born in uh, Missouri. At the age of 12, his father dies. He left school. He was an apprentice, um, um, a printer's devil, a printer's apprentice for his older brother, Orion, who ran a series of newspapers um, in Missouri and Iowa. By Twain's early 20s, he was a newspaper pilot, uh, so I'm sorry, a um, riverboat pilot on the Mississippi River, River in April, of, um, I'm sorry, this is a very large crowd, and I got like people over here. All right, in uh, January 1861, uh, the Civil War breaks out, Twain is in New Orleans, his older brother Orion um, was uh, appointed the Secretary of Nevada, which at that time was a territory, was not in fact a state. Uh, Orion did not have money to take the Wells Fargo stagecoach out to um, Nevada, so his younger brother um, Samuel Clemens gave him the money. Um, Samuel Clemens, that was Mark Twain, uh, they go out to Nevada and the, the Mark Twain byline appears in a newspaper in February of 1863. Um, Twain covering uh, uh, Nevada became friends with these senators and the, and the congressmen who would then, when, when Nevada became a state in 1864, come to Washington. So there's just some brief preparatory remarks that I say because sometimes I've given talks and people say, well, you should have said that, so now I'm saying it. Okay, but before that even starts, so Mark Twain is about 17 years old, basically ran away from home. He goes to St. Louis, Philadelphia, uh, excuse me, St. Louis, New York, Philadelphia, and comes down to Washington. Um, and you can see this first slide is when Mark Twain comes to Washington in February of 1854. Okay, this is um, a print from a, a pretty well-known guidebook of Washington. As you can see, this is before the Statue of Freedom was on the Capitol, and this is Lower Pennsylvania Avenue. Someone remarked earlier today, looking at this, uh, she, uh, the person said we wish, she wishes we had this many trees on Pennsylvania Avenue today. So when Mark Twain comes to Washington in February of 1854, he's kind of following um, a tradition of journalists, authors, writers coming to Washington and remarking on the capital city. Um, Washington was in fact a planned city and it was a real source of intrigue and interest from a lot of writers, one being Alexis de Tocqueville. So Alexis de Tocqueville um, in 1832 visits Washington, later he uses his, his experiences in America to write um, Democracy in America. One of the interesting observations that uh, de Tocqueville made was about the culture of journalism in America because in Europe, journalists really were uh, from the aristocratic classes, not something that you could work yourself into, you kind of like a birthright of being a journalist. Where in America, anyone who had enough money to buy a printing press, you know, in some backwater town, wherever could basically set up a newspaper. There really was no uh, vetting process for a journalist in, in America. So I, Tocqueville observed, observed that. So he said, in America, there is scarcely a hamlet which has not its own newspaper. It may readily be imagined that neither discipline nor unity of design can be communicated to so multifar multifarious a host, and each one is consequently led to fight under his own standard. All the political journals of the United States are arrayed indeed on the side of the administration or against it, but they attack and defend in a thousand different ways. And so one of the ways that Mark Twain used uh, journalism was kind of satire. Uh, also, Charles Dickens comes to Washington, which uh, to try to keep this presentation within the time, I'll just say you can read it in the book. I talk about Dickens. Okay, so one of the things that Twain experiences when he comes to Washington is his experience with the omnibuses. So if anyone here takes Metro, um, before the Metro, you had the streetcar. Before the streetcar, you had the omnibuses. And Twain um, writes a letter to his brother in February 1854, kind of his first travel dispatch, and describes Washington. The Washington Monument is not yet complete. It's kind of like a stump. Uh, like a chimney, and so Twain remarks on that, remarks on going to the patent office and some other things. And so one of the things that he uh, remarks on is experience waiting for an omnibus running down Pennsylvania Avenue, which is some of, I've take, taken the Metro almost every day for the past 12 or 13 years, most, a lot on the red line, so I have a lot of frustration, love-hate relationship with Metro, so this really kind of uh, stood out to me. So this is uh, Samuel Clemens writing about his experience in the Washington Omnibus. 
Then if you should be seized with the desire to go to the capital or somewhere else, you may stand in a puddle of water with the snow driving in your face for 15 minutes or more before an omnibus rolls lazily by. And when one does come 10 to one, there are 19 passengers inside and 14 outside. And while the driver casts on you a look of commiseration, you have the inexpressible satisfaction of knowing that you closely resemble a very moist dish rag and feel so too. At the same time that you are unable to discover what benefit you have derived from your 15 minutes soaking and so driving your fists into the inmost recesses of your breeches pockets, you stride away in despair with a step and grimace that would make the fortune of a tragedy actor, while your ornery appearance is greeted with screams of laughter from a pack of vagabond boys over the way. Such is life and such is Washington. <laughs> All right, so uh, then in between Twain's 1854 visit, I mentioned earlier, he goes to Nevada. Um, this gentleman, William Stewart, who if any real Washington, Washingtonian uh, historians will know, Stewart's castle off DuPont Circle was built by this fellow. So William Stewart is an interesting character. He was part of the first generation of Nevada um, congressmen and senators. And William Stewart, in the summer of 1867, invites uh, Twain to come to Washington to serve as his secretary. Now, one thing uh, I should say is that the, um, and I know you spoke to uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Donald Ritchie earlier today who, who contributed forward to this book who uh, he's really the source on all things history of Washington journalism but uh, so Mr. Ritchie could tell you or I guess I'm telling you in, in place of him is that we didn't have uh, back in 1860s 1870s you didn't have these ethics laws that you have today um, so like today George Stephanopoulos leads his show you couldn't have uh, George Stephanopoulos being the press secretary and then leading like a show on ABC but back um, in the 1860s there, there weren't those laws so you could have a Journalist is a, a secretary for a senator or a congressman who's working on committees and also writing for multiple newspapers. You, nowadays, you couldn't, you couldn't have that. So that's what Twain was doing. He was um, a j working journalist, but then he also had this um, job as a uh, secretary for Stewart. And um, it didn't work out uh, too well because, let me, let me see if I got this here. I might not have earmarked the constituent. No, I didn't. I'm not going to read the quote from you. Basically, uh, Twain was supposed to re uh, answer the constituent letters. And uh, he really kind of took it as a joke. And I, I have some, some of the letters that Twain wrote. And basically, these folks from Nevada write to the senator and say, we'd like um, to have a post office. You know, we're gaining in population. And then so Twain writes a letter back and says, you know, what the heck do you want with a post office? Wouldn't you rather have a jail? Uh, because, you know, because basically, if you know a post office is there, you know, you, be, you know, that area of Nevada, there's a high rate of illiteracy. So, you know, you're not going to be able to read the letters that come anyway. So then, so then the constituents send the, le send the letter back to Stewart, and Stewart kind of says, you know, what is this? And, and uh, so Twain was, Twain was quickly uh, dismissed. Um, so so this, is a, this is a photo of what a young uh, amber-hued Mark Twain looked like. This is actually from the Library of Congress's um, Prints and Photographs Division. This was taken in the summer of 1867. So this is a very youthful uh, looking Twain. He arrives in Washington in November uh, 22, November 23, 1867. He actually celebrates his 32nd uh, birthday in Washington. But he really to try to understand this phase of Mark Twain's life, he's still really living in anonymity. He had made his kind of name um, out in the um, the West Coast is like kind of this bohemian journalist. There's a new book out kind of about his experiences in San Francisco. But he wasn't really known on the East Coast. This is his first time kind of trying to um, establish himself in the East. All right. Um, in the research for this book, I found something that uh, I think is really interesting and exp possibly explosive. It's like an, possibly a new Mark Twain uh, writing. This was published. The Scupper Nong letter was published once in the New York Times. The Scupper Long was kind of this um, very satirical story of this uh, Washington correspondent who's fresh to, the, fresh to Washington and knows that one of the first things you need to do is you need to uh, go uh, interview the Army generals. So he has this kind of interview with Grant, and basically Grant is very reticent, doesn't really say anything, and so Scupper Nong interprets his, his grunts and everything and basically says, okay, Grant, because of his grunts, is going to support Andrew Johnson's impeachment. Uh, and it's kind of an interest. It's kind of an interesting story, and so the Scupper Nong letter is not in the official Mark Twain canon. Um, there really are, and there's an incredible infrastructure of Twain studies and Twain scholars, and I haven't really had time to write like a um, a journal article arguing for why I believe this is um, uh, part of the Mark Twain kind of um, canon. But as you can see, this is actually from the Evening Telegraph that was published um, two days later on November 30. And the, when the Evening Telegraph published it on page six, it ha they added by Mark Twain. So specula my speculation is possibly one of the editors there 
um, knew Twain and added his byline. At this time, Twain is writing for the New York Tribune. He's the Washington correspondent for the Daily Alta California, the Virginia City Territorial Enterprise. He also wrote for the Chicago Republican. He wrote a couple pieces in the Evening Star, the Sunday Morning Chronicle. These were all Washington newspapers of, of the day. I think I'm doing pretty good on time. All right, local news. This is where you guys might have a little fun. All right, so local news. This was published uh, November 24, 1867. In the Evening Star, local news, no cow allowed about the city hall. Mayor Wallach yesterday complained of Washington Rollins, Captain Madison, Patrick Foley, Sarah E. Cook, and Mary Carroll as allowing their cows to trespass upon the lot in the rear of the city hall. They were arraigned before Justice Walter, fined each five and one dollar costs. So, you know, this uh, in itself kind of seems like a funny story, but this was kind of the, um, the environment of Washington back then. There was run, like chickens and pigs and cows all over the place, and so it really was kind of uh, this is real news. So when Twain, Twain is a man of uh, really a thousand places, and a lot of places claim him, and so now hopefully Washington can claim him a little bit. So what I think, uh, when Twain, whenever he would go to a locale, whether it's Cincinnati, San Francisco, Carson City, um, he, uh, places in Europe, Twain spent about a third of his life overseas. He would kind of absorb whatever the local culture was and uh, kind of satire. I mean, uh, he wrote a lot about kind of the German language and stuff, and he basically said that, uh, like, if a cat got hold of an irregular verb, like, there goes the cat because he couldn't pronounce it. So all sorts of things. He, he kind of did satire on whatever, whatever locality he was in at the time. So um, this piece was really interesting because uh, this, this struck my eye because Twain wrote um, a little item in the Daily Alta California on January 12, 1868, that is, bears resemblance to this real news item. This is what Twain wrote. On New Year's morning, while Mr. George Worley's front door was standing open, a cow marched into the house, a cow that was out making her annual calls, I suppose, and before she was discovered had eaten up everything in the new, on the New Year's table in the parlor. Mr. Worley was not acquainted with the cow, never saw her before, and is, at a, and is at a loss to account for the honor of her visit. What do you think of a town where cows make New Year's calls? It may be the correct thing, but it has not been so regarded in the circles in which I have been accustomed to move. Morals are at a low stage in Washington, beyond question. <laughs> so we all, we all kind of know um, Twain's political satire. Actually, out of his experiences as a, as a Washington journalist, he then later wrote um, with uh, Charles Dudley Warner in 1873, The Gilded Age, which was Twain's um, uh, first, first novel. So, uh, so, but he didn't just talk about like the, the political environment. He also talked about local Washington, even the climate, which today it's about 94 degrees outside. But uh, for those of you who lived in Washington for, you know, year or many years, you know that uh, the temperature can fluctuate like almost 50 degrees in about 24 hours. And uh, you know, global climate change, global warming, all this other stuff. Whatever your opinion is, I think it's there's a history of this wet, these weather patterns being unique to Washington. And Mark Twain wrote about them. All right, here, this is, uh, well, I'm not going to give you the exact date. Twain wrote this after he'd been in Washington only a couple weeks. As politics goes, so goes the weather. It trims to suit every phase of sentiment and is always ready. Today it is a Democrat, tomorrow a radical. The next day neither one thing nor the other. If a Johnson man goes over to the other side, it rains. If a radical deserts to the administration, it snows. If New York goes Democratic, it blows. Naturally enough, if Grant expresses an opinion between two whiffs of smoke, it spits a little sleet uneasily. If all is quiet on the Potomac of politics, one sees only the soft haze of Indian summer from the Capitol windows. If the president is quiet, the sun comes out. If he touches the tender gold market, it turns up cold and freezes out the speculators. If he hints at foreign troubles, it hails. If he threatens Congress, it thunders. If treason and impeachment are broached, lo, there is an earthquake. If you are posted on politics, you are posted on the weather. I cannot manage either. When I go out with an, uh, when I go out with an umbrella, the sun shines. If I go... Without it, it rains. If I leave my overcoat with me, I am bound to roast. If I haven't, I am bound to freeze. Some people like Washington weather. I don't. Some people admire mixed weather. I prefer to take mine straight. <laughs> Twain would frequently come back to Washington um, almost every year, uh, frequently actually to lobby um, the Librarian of Congress or members of Senate and Congress for a new copyright law, um, as, as Dr. Cole knows. But uh, he would, he, when he was in Washington, there's actually a series of letters that he writes to Olivia Langdon, um, who's his wife, and he, he, Twain commented on Washington weather for many decades, uh, but I won't give you more anecdotes. All right, so um, this is an example of uh, one of the papers that Mark Twain wrote for. 
Um, this is a little different setup than I had last time. Last time I had the screen, I could point to it. But uh, I don't know if anyone could see it. It's this uh, second column, Mark Twain in Washington. Uh, this is kind of a really interesting um, little clip. And David C. Mearns, who uh, folks here who work at the Library of Congress will know that he was the head of the Manuscripts Division, I believe, in the 40s and 50s. Um, and there actually is an oversized binder of um, uh, clippings, Mark Twain's Washington writings that are in the Manuscripts Division. And it was, it was actually one of the first things I did when I started this research. And this is, um, this is one of the clippings that, that's in that file. So um, shout out to the Library of Congress. OK. Uh, so this is uh, Edward Savage's painting of the Washington family. I just recently got into a kind of a debate with one of my friends here. So you can see there's one member of the family who doesn't look like they're part of kind of the Washington, let's say, family, I guess. Uh, standing to the right, that gentleman is William Billy Lee, which if anyone has visited Mount Vernon knows kind of a little bit about William Billy Lee. He was General Washington's body servant. Um, now we're asking, what does this have to do with Mark Twain? All right, well, so Mark Twain, um, I'm guessing there's some real Twain scholars in the audience. Twain is someone who, um, by writing Huckleberry, the Advent uh, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn in 1885, really took the issue of uh, race um, head on in a, a very subversive way. There's some people say that Huckleberry Finn was a progressive novel. Other people say it's like a uh, Jim is a very stereotypical minstrel type character. Uh, Putting Ed Wilson is another book that Mark Twain wrote that kind of talks about the unique kind of issue of race in America. Twain was not someone who um, shied away from writing about race and, uh, and other kind of sorts of cultural issues. So I say this because, when, and also when Twain grew up, uh, he had an uncle who, um, the Quarles Farm, where he basically would sit elbow to elbow with kind of enslaved children, and they would all listen to these kind of stories of um, Aunt Hannah and Uncle Daniel, and Twain writes in his autobiography about kind of, as a child, his experiences in in Missouri. So with that said, Twain was kind of very sensitive uh, to issues of race. Now when he leaves New Orleans in uh, January 1861, he goes to the West Coast, he goes to Sandwich Islands, which are known as Hawaii, he um, then goes over kind of to the Middle East, the Holy Land in the summer of 1867. When he comes back to, Wa when he comes to Washington in November of 1867, he's back into the, in the South for the first time. And I mean, some people today, if you're not from maybe Washington, uh, you come to Washington, oh, it's a very southern city, and uh, more so in the, um, right after the Civil War. So uh, what does this have to do with Mark Twain? Well, one of the things that Twain wrote in February of 1868 was his story on General Washington's Negro body servant, which uh, I don't know if they have any more books left, but it's in the book. Uh, it's kind of a long, long story but uh, it's kind of unique to Washington, D.C. history. I don't know if anyone knows who this gentleman is. This is Yaro Mamu. This is photo is, uh, excuse me, this oil painting is from 1822. It's displayed in the Peabody Room of the, George, um, the Georgetown uh, Branch Library of the D.C. Public Library. Um, Charles Wilson Peale, who was a very famous painter, also painted a, a photo of um, Yaro. There was a book out a couple years ago about Yaro. He was believed to be 150 years old. Um, there's some other things, kind of unique Washington, D.C. history about uh, kind of folklore, black folklore about General Washington's body servant, basically that any time an older black person died, they were General Washington's body servant. It was kind of this like running joke with editors and newspapers and, and the Twain, the, 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 the joke really kind of was running for a long, long time. Actually, 1913, the New York Sun ran a little item that said an older uh, uh, black man in Washington had passed away. And he was actually um, George Washington's body servant. He knew George Washington since he was a child and saw George Washington take the uh, ax to the cherry tree. So this is in 1913. So anyway, so it's really kind of interesting because Twain, this is one of the first um, writings that Twain kind of wrote about, let's say, race, the complexity of race in America, and not any dig on Twain scholars, but like no Twain scholar really has talked about this, uh, this, this kind of story. So I tried to really dive into it in the book. All right, so now more, no, uh, that was a little serious. Now more fun. All right, so boarding. Okay, so Mark Twain, I don't know, uh, it's, uh, all these millennials in Washington, okay? Like millennials, like they live like in these, you know, like one bedroom apartment, there's like six people in there. And like, you know, if you have a dirty roommate, you're not gonna like him. Well, Mark Twain was probably not someone you wanted to have as a roommate, <laughs> which I showed this little item uh, because this is actually when, when Twain first comes to Washington in late November, 1867, the, um, probably getting this wrong. I want to say the 39th Congress, 39th or 40th Congress, I forget. Um, but 
they, they put the boarding notices in the paper, and then by February there weren't many notices, and they would put where the senators and congressmen were actually living. So if Twain came to Washington, did, did not know where Senator Stewart was saying, he could have seen it in the paper. And um, in, in 1908, Stewart writes an autobiography and contributes an, uh, an entire chapter devoted to Twain, and he writes about how Twain was a really bad uh, roommate, and he smoked uh, all his cigars and drank all his liquor. And the landlady basically said that, uh, who is this guy? He's smoking a bed. He's going to set, set the bed sheets on fire, and then I'm going to be out of a house. And so that's kind of one little element of Twain being uh, a not very good roommate. And then another one was in 1883, Hiram Ramsdell, who was a journalist who uh, Twain lived with, wrote an account of um, Twain as a roommate. This is an 1887 plat map. Um, as you can see, Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, this is kind of the area in which Twain um, lived. He lived, uh, actually by his own admission, five different places. He lived on uh, 356 C Street North, which is right in this area, 76 Indiana Avenue. Um, so this is kind of the little area in which he it was his, were his stopping grounds. Uh, this is Ramsdell recalling Twain as a roommate. Twain's little drum stove was full of ashes running over on the zinc sheet, which was covered all over. The bed seemed to be unmade for a week. The slops had not been carried out for a fortnight. The room was sour with tobacco smoke. The floor, dirty enough to begin with, was littered with newspapers from which Twain had cut his letters. Then there were hundreds of pieces of torn manuscripts which had been written and then rejected by the author. A dozen pipes were about the apartment, on the washstand, on the mantel, on the writing table, on the chairs. Everywhere that room could be found. And there was tobacco, and tobacco everywhere. One thing is that there were no flies. The smoke killed them. And I'm now surprised that it, and I'm now surprised that it did not kill me too. Twain would not let a servant come into his room. He would strip down to his suspenders, his coat and vest, of course, being off, and walk back and forward in his, in his slippers in his little room and swear and smoke the whole day long. Of course, at times he would work, and when he did work, it was like a steam engine at full head. Um, this is Fifth and Indiana Avenue. This is the, there are very, very few buildings uh, left on Pennsylvania Avenue in the immediate kind of downtown area that Mark Twain would have walked past the uh, appellate court building is the old city hall. Um, to the left of Subway is Daniel Webster's old law office. Um, the building permits for these buildings, they were built in the 1840s, so that definitely part, kind of where Mark Twain would have walked to Newspaper Row, he would have walked past these buildings. Um, not to go into too much detail, uh, Vic Fisher at the Mark Twain papers at UC Berkeley was very, very helpful. And um, this is a little sketch that uh, Twain's landlord at his home on C Street sent to John Russell Young, which uh, some people who know John Russell Young was actually at one point um, the Librarian of Congress. Before he was the Librarian of Congress, he was an editor of the New York Tribune. So when Twain was writing for the New York Tribune, he was dealing with um, Twain, which is not, is, is not an easy guy to deal with. In the late 1880s, uh, John Russell Young started to compile kind of a memoir of all the various famous people that he knew. And it, he must have gotten in contact with Hoagland. Ho they kind of did a walkthrough of uh, what Twain's neighborhood was like. And, and then Hoagland sends Russell Young um, a detailed letter describing their experiences. And he drew this little sketch on the back of the um, letter. And to the left, or Yes, to the left. To the left is Havener's baker, baker shop. There was like actually a bakery next door, which is a really crude joke, which I won't tell, but it's in the book, uh, about kind of living next door to the bakery and lady falls in the stove and you have to read it. Uh, so then Hoagland is, that's where, that's where Twain lived. So um, something like this small brick. So it's kind of cool. This is you know, more unpublished material, primary source for all the students. Okay. Uh, how am I doing on time? All right. Uh, this is a photo of General Ambrose Burnside uh, in camp reading a uh, newspaper. Matthew Brady is in the photograph. Well, why am I showing this? That's because I'm going to start to tell you some of Twain's roommates. I mean, Twain was quite a character, but his roommates were, were equally characters. Uh, so one of the gentlemen that he lived with was William Swinton. William Swinton was a really fascinating guy. If anyone's a real historian, they'll know in General Grant's memoirs, he actually mentions William Swinton. He mentions Swinton in the context of Swinton had said that he was a historian and he was attaching himself to the Army of the Potomac and was going to write a history of the Civil War when it was over. Well, Swinton was actually lying. He was really corresponding for the New York Times. And around the Civil War is when you had the um, byline started to show up because journalists would publish material and generals would say, why did you publish where we are? Where we are? And then so the newspaper editors said, okay, we need bylines. So that's how that happened in the Civil War. So William Swinton, um, 
They find out he's a journalist. They say, okay, get away from here. You know, you're not welcome. If we see you again, it's going to be trouble. Well, he went right back and um, to General Ambrose Burnside's kind of little area, and he's Burnside's having a meeting with the staff sergeants, and they see Swinton kind of stumping uh, behind this tree, and they go and drag him. They say, what are you doing? And, they, and then Burnside oh, said, I've heard about this guy. He's basically, you know, publishing our movements. And so they were going to shoot Swinton on sight, and Ambrose uh, Burnside had this, before he executed journalists, had to kind of send up uh, asking permission from headquarters, and Grant said, you know, no, we can't be shooting journalists. That's not going to be very good for us. So Swinton then actually is roommates with Mark Twain. They were these really... Uh, oh man, they got into all sorts of trouble. Uh, they would drink John Barley corn and they would basically go out the street and kind of pander, uh, basically pander for $3 to get their John Barley corn. And they're really kind of interesting. Swinton is a really fascinating guy. It's another guy who I find really interesting, George Alfred Townsend. Um, if you see, he has gloves on his hands. Uh, Townsend was known to beat up other journalists in 1874. One of the journalists libeled him, and uh, Townsend went over to Newspaper Row and basically proceeded to pummel him. Um, Townsend has kind of been forgotten today, but he was one of the um, foremost journalists of the second half of the uh, 19th century. And Townsend and Twain um, corresponded for many years, and I'll show actually a photo with Townsend and Twain in it later. Um, I really like Townsend. He was, he, this is a little cigar tin box. Mark Twain also was, there were so many different products that Mark Twain hawked. Um, and also other big time journalists did the same thing as, as well as Townsend. This is uh, in Burkittsville, Maryland. Townsend built this. He's very ostentatious. And I guess I'm showing this because Twain kind of was, had a very larger than life taste and so did these journalists that he, he also lived with. All right, George W. Adams. Um, in 1867, the Evening Star was up for sale. George W. Adams was one of the four people who bought the Evening Star and helped keep it afloat. Now, let's see, where's the toast? Okay, so George W. Adams was the head of the Newspaper Correspondence Club, and while Twain was in Washington in January of 1868, they had a little banquet, and they asked Twain to give the 15th toast, which uh, is kind of, is, won't go into detail about that, but there's another thing that uh, happened at this toast that was really interesting. Um, I'll just read this. This is, this is Twain writing the Daily Alta, Cal Daily Alta California, remembering um, his, his fun time at this newspaper correspondence uh, banquet. At 12 midnight, it was announced from the chair that the Sabbath was come and that a due regard for the Christian character of our country demanded that the festivities should now come to an abrupt termination. The regular toasts were not finished yet. The fun was at its zenith. Here was a scrape. How would you have gotten out of it? I will tell you how we managed it, and it will be worth your while to lay the information away for private use hereafter. It was gravely moved and has gravely seconded and carried that we do now discontinue the use of Washington time and adopt the time of San Francisco. And then we bowled along as serenely as ever. We gained about three hours and a half by the operation. How was that for ingenuity? It was easy sailing after that when we had used up all the San Francisco time and got to crowding Sunday again. We took another vote and adopted Hong Kong time. I suppose we would have been going west yet if the champagne had not given out. Okay, society in Washington, um, it was really like I've already kind of alluded to, it was just a very, very different town, a very, very different time. Um, Speaker Schuyler Colfax, who uh, Grant's first vice president, when he was Speaker of the House while Twain was in Washington, he would frequently have um, uh, events at his house or kind of receptions, and the public would be invited, and they would be basically advertised in the, in the paper. Um, Colfax lived on Lafayette Square, which is right near the White House, and this is a little listing in the... Um, National Intelligencer from February of 1868, mentioning society in Washington, Speaker Colfax's spacious parlors were again thronged last evening on the occasion of his weekly reception with the most brilliant assemblage composed as usual of official dignitaries of every branch of the government, etc., etc. Well, when Mark Twain was in Washington, he was a very conspicuous character. He liked to go to these parties, probably because they had free champagne and he really could make a scene. And Emily Edson Briggs, who was a famous um, one of the most famous uh, uh, women journalists of the 19th century actually featured Mark Twain in one of her Washington letters. And this was when Twain attended um, a reception at Speaker Colfax's house. Mark Twain, the delicate humorist, was present, quite a lion as he, as, he, as he deserves to be. Mark is a bachelor, faultless in taste, whose snowy vest is suggestive of endless quarrels with Was Washington washerwomen. But the heroism of Mark is settled for all time, for such purity and smoothness were never seen before. His lavender, his lavender gloves might have been stolen from some Turkish harem, so delicate were they in size. 
All right, this bookstore. Uh, so this was a bookstore, French and Richardson's, which was the most, uh, one of the most prominent uh, bookstores of its day. It was on Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, today, the uh, FBI building at 9th, uh, 9th and Pennsylvania Avenue is um, where, this, where this used to stand. This stood until the 1960s. When Twain comes to Washington, he had self-published his first book, um, uh, kind of the jumping frog. He ha had not written any formal books yet. When he's in Washington, he gets an offer from the American Publishing Company. Out of that offer, uh, The Innocents Abroad uh, is produced. During Twain's lifetime, The Innocents Abroad was um, his best-selling book. Today, we think of Tom Sawyer or, or Huck Finn or some of his other books, but Innocents Abroad really catapulted his fame. So I show this bookstore because one of the things that Twain did while he was in Washington is he visited all the bookstores. And his buddy Charles Henry Webb uh, from California uh, came down to Washington and brought him a couple copies of The Jumping Frog. And Twain went to French and Richardson's and basically said, hey, my name is Mark Twain. You've never heard of me, maybe, but I have a book. Would you sell it? Well, French and Richardson's did sell it. And not only did they sell it, they advertised it in the newspaper. This is from the Daily Morning Chronicle from February 22, 1868. And you can see on the bottom is The Jumping Frog by Mark Twain for $1.50. Well, Dr. Cole, I think you'll be happy because I think I'm going pretty good on time. We'll have time for question and answer. Okay. Um, okay. So this is uh, another bookstore. This bookstore was right by the Capitol. This was called the Old Curiosity Shop. This was a different bookshop. Now, this is kind of really interesting. Um, because the James uh, Guild, who was the proprietor from 1867 until um, 1912, was kind of a real, really cantankerous guy. This, was, is, this is from a book in 1902. It might be a little difficult to see, but you can see the proprietor is reading a book, and he's surrounded by books. It's all over the place, and he really doesn't even care if customers come in. Well, um, Mr. Guild was interviewed many, many times over the years, and he was frequently uh, asked who were you know, some of his famous uh, guests, because diplomats and congressmen and senators, everything would come in, and also literary folks would come in. And so he would say, well, you know, Mark Twain has been, he been in here, but his humor is really forced. He always tries to talk to me a lot, but he never buys any books, so he's really not kind of welcome in this shop. <laughs> so I think it's really kind of interesting that the, the, that the owner of this bookstore you know, really didn't even care. Like Mark Twain, famous out there, who cares if you're not buying a book, you know, you know like money talks. So anyway, so. Um, does anyone know uh, who this is or where this bookstore is? Call it out. Capitol. Capitol Hill Books, thank you. Okay, this is my main man, uh, Jim Toole. Okay, Jim Toole is a great guy. He kind of carries on the tradition of uh, James Guild because, as you can see, uh, Jim is surrounded by books everywhere. Capitol Hill Books is a really great store. Um, and if you've ever been in the shop, you kind of know how Jim is. Uh, it took two years. It took me me about two years going into the bookstore for Jim to actually even say like, hey, how are you? And then now we're good buddies and I actually feature this photo in the book and a uh, little kind of brief interview with, with uh, Jim. All right, this is on Wisconsin Avenue. This is Geraldine Sapp, who as long as I've been going to Georgetown, she's always out there kind of doing her street ministry. And you know, she's from Tampa. Um, this is the aged women's home of Georgetown, which you might say, what does this have to do with Mark Twain? Well, in February 1868, Mark Twain gave a benefit lecture and the proceeds from that benefit lecture went to start the Aged Women's Home of Georgetown. They got $15,000 from William uh, Corcoran, and it's been um, at this location since 1868. Actually, this home is really, really old. George Washington actually visited there. Um, and this is a little item in the Georgetown Courier. Um, Forest Hall tonight, Mark Twain, the genial, witty, and humorous Californian, will deliver a lecture at Forest Hall this evening for the benefit of the Ladies' Union Benevolent Society. The subject which, which he has chosen is the Sandwich Islands, and from what we know of Mark, we feel confident that he will make his mark. No pun is here intended, for he can write as well as talk. Um, by the original way in which his theme will be treated, he deserves himself to be treated also to a large audience because of his volunteering his services for this benevolent object, and we hope to see the hall crowded on the occasion of Mark Twain's lecture. Okay, this is a 1922 photo of Forest Hall. Does anyone know where this, what's there today? Call it out. The Gap! Okay? <laughs> so you can see. Okay, so this is 1922, and you can see kind of the ornamentation around the brick. Um, you know, very, very nice structure. And then it's today, so they, you know, kind of looks very, very much the same. And uh, allegedly, Forest Hall is haunted or something like that. Or, I mean, the Gap building is haunted because it was a military prison in the Civil War. But I don't know if it's Mark Twain's ghost that haunts there, but it's really cool. And uh, so, yeah, maybe there should be like a plaque out there one day that says Mark Twain gave a lecture here. <laughs> All right, this is Andrew Johnson. So Andrew Johnson um, 
was impeached by the House in late February of 1868. At this time, Mark Twain was trying to write the Innocence Abroad, he was trying to kind of get his manuscript together, um, but he had all these, all these fellow kind of bohemian, uh, hard-drinking journalists to say, hey, Mark, let's go out to a bar, let's go to a party. He really couldn't kind of get his writing done. Um, and then Johnson's impeachment is happening, which is really like the biggest news story of, of, of its day, and uh, Twain really wasn't interested in this. This is Newspaper Row, um, which today is 14th and F Street, kind of where the National Press Club is today. This is a print from March 7, 1868. This is the uh, front of Harper's Weekly, which this was actually um, on the, co the cover of Mr. Ritchie's book. So I showed this because March 7, 1868, Mark Twain actually leaves Washington. He goes to San Francisco to negotiate um, kind of the copyright um, of his, the, his travel letters that have been published in the San Francisco newspaper, and then he stays out in San Francisco and finishes The Innocents Abroad. So he kind of, his, his time in Washington is short-lived. Um, this is the National Hotel. There's a story associated with this, which is in the book, which I won't tell today. This is where the museum is um, today at 6th and Pennsylvania Avenue. That was a telegraph office. Mark Twain was too cheap, or his newspapers didn't pay him a lot of money. He actually didn't telegraph his stories. He would send them um, by letter. So this is a photo that was taken in February of 1871 by Matthew Brady. I kind of imposed the Mark Twain in Washington. This is an old little promotional photo. So as anyone know, the person on the uh, right was my main man, George Alfred Townsend. Okay, in the middle is Mark Twain, and then to uh, Twain's left is this gentleman, David Gray from Buffalo. I won't bore you with details about David Gray. So, why am I showing this photo? Because the um, great staff here at the Library of Congress was able to dig up a um, really valuable resource, and this is actually Matthew Brady's logbook, which I have cropped, and you can see Samuel Clemens, Buffalo, George Alfred Townsend, Washington, D.C., David Gray. Now, what's really interesting about this logbook is that um, Clemens, Townsend, and Gray actually signed their own names. All the previous entries you can see basically it's an assistant writing, writing the person's name that sat for the photographs. Um, but for this one, Clemens actually wrote his own name, which is kind of cool. Okay, this is Ainsworth Spofford, who was the Librarian of Congress um, for many, many years. He was really kind of a revolutionary um, or transformative figure in the um, history of the Library of Congress. Um, Dr. Cole has written about uh, Spofford. And Mark Twain uh, sent many, many letters to Spofford because uh, Twain kind of had this long standing beef, if you will, I guess, with the copyright laws because um, there was no enforcement of international copyright law and uh, Twain thought he was basically losing a lot of money. So he would come to Washington quite frequently and lobby uh, members of Congress and the Senate and um, frequently visit the Librarian of Congress saying, hey, we need a new copyright law, which I will um, in a little bit share more information about that. Um, this is a print from Punch magazine from 1885. Can anyone see where Mark Twain is? So he's in the, he's in the uh, front, uh, front left. He's in the red cap, it says Mark Twain. So you can see the delegation of American authors. You got Mark Twain, um, some uh, William Dean Howells, um, some other famous authors are there, and then you can see the kind of Franco delegation, British de delegation, German delegation, all these basically authors, and they're targeting the kind of international pirate of you know, copyright thievery. Okay, so this is uh, Mark Twain in a white suit. In December of 1906, Mark Twain premieres this white suit. He's actually at a copyright hearing at the Library of Congress, and he's one of the last people to speak. And uh, about four o'clock, it's his turn, so he's in this kind of black frock coat. He throws off the black frock coat, and oh my gosh, it's December, he's wearing white, what is he doing? He's upturning the conventions of the season, it's scandalous. Okay, then he made kind of a very improvised speech on copyright law, um, and then throughout the country the next day, um, from Chicago to New York, um, Washington, there was headlines, you know, Mark Twain in a white suit. So basically, he was very, very calculated on Mark Twain's behalf. He was able to get an incredible amount of publicity for his, um, his opinions on copyright law. Um, uh, Champ Clark, Joe Cannon, who were speakers of the House, Twain had all sorts of running correspondence with them over copyright law. Eventually, before Mark Twain um, uh, dies, kind of a new copyright law is enacted, which he felt very beneficial to him. And one of his kind of quotes uh, at, the, at the copyright hearing is that um, the copyright hearing, uh, it, it basically children can, what was it, that, uh, the proceeds from his, his books should be able to benefit his children, and the grandchildren can add, they can take care of themselves. 
Okay, this is the Willard Hotel. Um, this is Peacock Alley, which um, the Willard Hotel, um, the current Willard Hotel is really like the new Willard Hotel. There was a Willard Hotel when Mark Twain was in Washington in the 1860s. Uh, he writes actually in a letter describing the old Willard as a seventh rate hash house. But the, uh, the Willard in 1904 kind of premiered as a grand hotel. And after Twain has his a testimony to the Library of Congress. He comes back to the Willard and um, he takes the elevator from upstairs and it kind of lets out right into the dining room. And so he kind of, you know, goes into the dining room and everyone really doesn't look up from the meal. They're not very amused and they, they're really hungry. And so Twain is not satisfied with that entrance. So he says to his, his personal biographer that he's with, he says, that's not, you know, that's not good enough. We need to, we need to do this entrance again. So they go back upstairs, then they, then they um, take the elevator and they get, get off at a different point and then they the Peacock Alley, if anyone knows, kind of has a little stairs and you kind of walk down the stairs and you can kind of swagger down Peacock Alley. So Twain goes back down, everyone's kind of, you know, smoking their cigars and drinking their teas, having their conversations. So he kind of walks down Peacock Alley, hey, good to see you. Oh, Mark, great, you know, great testimony. So he was really just soaking it in. And then so he goes to the, um, the uh, front of the dining room, throws open the doors and everyone kind of sees Mark Twain. They actually get up and applaud him and say, oh, you know, great Mark Twain, so happy to hear you. So happy to have you here. So uh, Twain really liked the, uh, liked the affection and so this is kind of another place in Washington that, you know, the spirit or ghost of Mark Twain haunts these halls. All right, well, that is the presentation. I try not to bore you with too much minutia, which I can really easily do. So I think now we have about uh, 10 minutes for questions. Yes. It's a great question. Um, Twain wrote over two dozen newspaper correspondence pieces. Uh, as I mentioned, he was writing for the Chicago Republican, the New York Tribune, um, Daily Alta California, San Francisco, um, Daily Alta California, the Virginia City Territory, Enterprise. All of those correspondence are captured in the manuscript division, have, has an oversized folder with those pieces. Um, he also, uh, while he was in Washington, did, did write one piece for the Galaxy Magazine, which was a New York literary piece, which is, that was General Washington's Negro body servant. Um, there's the Scupper Nong letters, and I like to add that to what Twain wrote. Um, so he wrote over, let's say, about 30 piece, 30 like items or 30 um, newspaper correspondence. But the thing to understand too about Twain's Washington letters is they weren't like four or five hundred word pieces. They were anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 words, which um, is pretty sizable for a newspaper column. And um, he frequently uses experiences in Washington uh, as a source of like satire later, the Gilded Age. Also, he would later write kind of about his Washington experiences. John Henry Riley was another uh, journalist that he, that he lived with, and he wrote a piece in um, The Galaxy about his uh, reminiscence of kind of living with Riley, and he said that Riley and Twain were very conspicuous in Washington because they actually paid their rent. And um, so he, fre he would frequently kind of mention Washington, um, but his, when he's in Washington, he's really writing for the money. I mean, he's all sorts of correspondence um, that are now digitized the Mark Twain project, and he's really trying to negotiate. Okay, you know, give me thirty-five dollars for this piece. Okay, fifty dollars for that piece. And by his, his own admission, he was writing furiously because he really needed the money. Yes. Yes. Uh, the question was, did Twain have any um, interaction or correspondence with Clara Barton while he was in Washington? And I cannot give you a definitive answer on that question. Um, I really, I really don't know. Um, you, the, the way the Mark Twain papers are set up online at UC Berkeley, you can basically keyword search. I'm going to guess that uh, Twain obviously had some sort of knew Claire Barton, like as you mentioned, James Redpath had kind of um, the equivalent of the Washington Speakers Bureau back in that day. Frederick Douglass was a member of Redpath Speakers Bureau. Twain was. Many other prominent abolitionists, suffragists, uh, temperance leaders, all sorts of issues. That's I believe that you, Claire Barton was uh, was part of that lecture. Um, 
uh, forum. Uh, Walt Whitman was living in Washington while Twain was here. Um, I have no evidence that Whitman and Twain knew each other or even interacted while they were here in Washington, but Twain and Whitman later knew each other, and Whitman actually at one point needed some money. Twain sent him um, some money. Um, when Twain was in Washington, like I said, he really was kind of living in anonymity. He wasn't yet a famous novelist. Actually, a lot of during the research, a lot of the journalists that he that he lived with really didn't think he was going to amount to anything. And when he became such a large success, they were all like, man, they were, they were actually correspondence between journalists saying like, you know, oh, can you believe Twain with his new book, you know, or, or, or you know, I never thought he'd amount to anything. And then, like, you know, me too. So it's really kind of interesting. So, um, I mean, the Twain was really kind of pretty uncouth, really rough around the edges. I think Claire Barton was probably a pretty dignified, you know, lady. So, uh, he would have maybe like offended her if they had met. He probably would have said something a little, you know, uh, off color, I guess. But um, I mean, I, I, we can talk later. I can try to look that up for you if you like. Yes, you. I'm curious where Mark Twain's uh, comedy came from. Eccentric yes. Um, the question. The question was, where did Mark Twain's um, humor come from? Um, I think that's a great question. I think that um, as a as a as a child, uh, he was, I guess, exposed to let's say lots of different uh, cultures and people, and I, I think he saw how humor was really a with humor kind of um, uh, put people like not if people were let's say on the defenses or touchy or whatever, like humor could kind of really break up that tension. Um, he's really uh, Twain had a lot of tragedy in his life. Um, his younger brother, his younger brother dies. Um, while he, Twain kind of blamed himself for it, his his daughter only he has no living heirs today. His his wife dies before he does. Two of his daughters die before he does. Um, in 1865, late 1865, he writes a letter to his mother and sister, and basically saying that he's realized his calling and his calling is uh, um, writing, and it's of the low order, being humorous writing. So Twain really, I think, realized that he could distinguish himself using humor and satire. And what also made Twain different than like Artemis Ward or Petroleum Nasby or some of the other kind of um, humorists, does anyone know, like Artemis, um, Artemis Ward was, a, was one of the fam favorite humorists of Abraham Lincoln. They would write in basically um, like phonetic spelling or kind of like all sorts of broken language and that's kind of the way they made like it funny. It wasn't necessarily maybe like really the story but kind of like how the words were spelled and Twain really didn't want to be um, uh, identified with that group of like humorous. He wanted to make kind of humor on his own way. So as you can see, he kind of didn't use the phonetic spelling and double entendres and stuff like that. He actually just would take something that happened and kind of satirize it. Um, I hope that kind of answers your question. Great question. Um, still, actually, I think some debate on when actually Grant and Twain meet for the first time. Um, this is actually a letter that, that uh, Twain sends to his family in early 1868, basically saying that Twain and Swinton were going to a cocktail, cocktail party and they were trying to corner Grant and they were trying to uh, get him to talk with some whiskey sours. And so I think that Tw Twain was trying to kind of basically interview Grant when he's, when he's in Washington. I don't know if he really ever did meet with him. Uh, James W. Nye, who was another senator from Nevada, actually introduced them uh, at one point. And Grant later retells the story. Basically, Grant and Twain kind of really didn't have, to have anything to say to each other. They were kind of like, oh, they were almost caught up in the moment. Um, and they were both kind of embarrassed. Um, Twain developed a relationship with him over, over I guess, many years. Um, Twain. I guess how to say this. He was very critical of like elected leaders and people in power, but then at the same time, if they invited him to come to the White House, he would he would jump at the occasion. There's a, there's a, a story where he goes to visit the White House uh, with, when Grover Cleveland is president, and he gives uh, First Lady uh, this little card, and the card is from Olivia, and and basically said Olivia wanted Olivia Twain's wife wanted the First Lady to to write off that basically Twain had not worn something which she she told him not to wear so he wouldn't embarrass himself so Twain kind of just goes up to her gives her the card and says can you please sign this uh, so Twain was freak, frequently go to the White House 
And as you mentioned, er, uh, as you mentioned, um, Charles, the Charles Webster Publishing Company, which Twain started, actually did publish Grant's memoirs. And it's really interesting because Twain um, was a member of the Marion County Rangers, which was kind of this improvised um, infantry unit of the Confederacy. And then Grant is the head of the Union forces. And then so but then they had this relationship. Um, and publication of Grant's memoirs really helped to secure the um, so financial solvency of the Grant family. Grant's um, son had made some really bad investments in Wall Street. And the American Century Magazine was actually going to publish Grant's memoirs. And then Twain kind of came in like at the last minute and basically said, here, I'll give you these terms, the kind of terms that, that he couldn't refuse. And um, that's another one. I don't know if that really answered your question. That was kind of a quick little overview. I think maybe we have time for two more, two more questions. Or we can just end early. Well, John, thank you. Another wonderful job. I think uh, we asked John to pay a little more attention to his research sources for obvious reasons today because of our visitors and our concern with uh, primary source materials. And he did a wonderful job. And you also, I think, got a sense of uh, John's wide perspective coming from DC local history on the wider culture as it comes and goes in and out of DC. And that also happened, as I said, in his first book. And he brings his own background to specific topics that give us an insight that we wouldn't have had otherwise. And I think it's a unique and wonderful gift that he has. So let's conclude. There's going to be a book signing. Uh, and we'll start right away. And then John uh, will also stick around to talk with some of our History Day uh, students uh, during an informal lunch that we'll have together. So a final round of applause for John. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.